Hi there. I had intended to do th this video of uh, news comment um, to refer to a case uh, involving a murder um, here in the UK. But uh, after the uh, astounding events and uh, near assassination of uh, former President Trump in Butler County uh, last weekend, um, I'm, I'm going to concentrate more on that aspect. So um, we'll kick off with um, what I'd already planned to talk about. And since the new TV news was reporting a triple murder in Bushy, Hertfordshire, but um, a suspect has been arrested, so the case is subdued to say, and um, I'm not going to refer to it specifically, but I, I do want to make some general points. It was alleged in the, that news report that the weapon used was a crossbow. So um, that's what we will uh, focus on. Now, one of the uh, TV reporters um, <clears throat> mentioned the um, dangers of crossbows. And um, this was in fact something I wrote about many years ago in Fighting Arts magazine, when uh, there were similar calls for bans on crossbows for very, very flimsy reasons. But in the event, there was a certain amount of legislation passed which put some restrictions on the sale. Now, one of the things that the reporter mentioned was that the crossbow had been used um, in 10 reported uh, killings in 10 years. So obviously one a year average. Now flower pots kill more people than that. The, again, with, without going into specifics, let's consider um, the um, possibility or the uh, supposition that a victim has been made captive and is tied up. And the <clears throat> things that make a, a crossbow uh, such an effective weapon are the range, it, it can be fired from a distance, the penetration and the fact that it's somewhat silent. Now, with, with a captive victim, uh, th those things don't count at all. That victim can be killed at leisure by any kind of blunt object or edged weapon whatsoever. So the, the fact that it was a crossbow is, is really immaterial and, and doesn't really have any significance, I would suggest. Um, and just as an aside, a crossbow is um, a hardly a concealable weapon uh, to be attractive to most criminal elements. And as far as penetration is concerned, it won't penetrate um, concealable Kevlar body armour. Okay, with that out of the way, and hopefully the calls for the, the ban on crossbows will subside, um, we will now go on to discuss the catastrophic uh, failures in the protective effort around former President Trump. Since the weekend, the actions of the US Secret Service have been analyzed online by a variety of experts. On one hand, you have a number of former supervisory agents from the Secret Service, now retired, who, generally speaking, praised the uh, activities of the service on the ground, and in one case actually claimed that it was a successful operation. On the other hand, you have a variety of experts with a background in law enforcement, sniping, military operations, etc., who have been highly critical 
of those actions. So what I will do is start with a couple of general points and then focus in on the specifics of Saturday's operation. The federal government uh, offers jobs and that is seen as uh, almost uh, a cake which a lot of people want a slice of. A lot of vested interest including Congress uh, sponsor various peoples to um, get well-paid jobs um, with good um, medical cover, pensions, etc., working for the federal government. In a lot of cases, for example, in the post office, it doesn't really matter the quality of the people you select. However, for federal law enforcement, such agencies as the DEA, the Federal Air Marshal Service, um, the, the uh, US Marshal Service and of course the Secret Service and up to 70 other agencies um, who confront uh, violent criminals and terrorists, then um, the kind of personnel you are recruiting uh, and sending for training and passing the training is uh, critical. You, you want the people who can do the job. And in the case of the Secret Service, that job is third party protection, protecting someone else and risking your own life to do so. That is the job of the bodyguard, succinctly. Uh, at the end of the day, putting your own body between a bullet and the man that you're protecting. And it takes certain characteristics, certain qualities, uh, and also certain physical attributes to accomplish this. And if you are such an agency, it would seem obvious that you would go for people who can display those attributes and qualities. And you would set up a testing uh, process very, very similar to what's what's done in um, many elite units um, to find out people with those qualities. And uh, I, I would suggest giving a preference to people with prior law enforcement experience or military experience. That doesn't happen. And for decades, um, the federal law enforcement has been um, a hotbed of um, vested interests and rather unsuitable people being uh, recruited, standards being lowered um, to, to actually make a joke of the whole process. So with that as the background, we'll now concentrate more specifically on the US Secret Service. To understand the failures on Saturday, we have to actually go back because the planning for such an event takes place well in advance. And in fact, it's called advanced security. There is a whole science and art to doing this and the Secret Service pride themselves on the ability to do this and in, <clears throat> in uh, to be quite fair to them they um, do a very very thorough and painstaking job in doing this they've been doing it for a long time in many many places and um, they really do know how to uh, plan a security operation so it can be weeks, it can be months in advance. Um, personnel will go to the um, location of the visit, the planned visit, and um, carry out a number of surveys. These surveys in include sites, which is um, the um, locations and um, places 
such as um, hotels, residences, stadiums, conference centres, theatres, golf courses, anywhere that the VIP is going to visit during that trip. Um, any kind of venue and the um, specific problems associated with securing that type of venue. Also included in that will be the arrival location, for example, airports or helipads, uh, train stations in some cases, and also the routes to and from. Routes will be uh, selected, they will be uh, recced, they will have alternates, and any kind of vulnerable features on those routes will be earmarked for special attention. For example, overpasses may be specified that every overpass will have personnel stationed on it. Each division of the Secret Service will have people present doing the advance. People from the uh, protective detail, people from the counter sniper teams, people from the counter assault team, people from the technical security, people from the magnetometer detail, people from the protective intelligence. And, <coughs> excuse me, in the case of a presidential visit, you would have air crew from Air Force One coming to scope out the um, landing area. So it's an enormously um, thorough and painstaking um, process which involves liaison with um, local and state law enforcement and in overseas um, venues with um, counterpart um, organizations there which in some cases can be very very helpful uh, and in others they can be downright hostile and um, a certain amount of diplomacy needs to take place <coughs> excuse me at the same time the staff of the vip in the case of the um, president the white house staff <coughs> also <coughs> excuse me also make um, uh, the, their own advance and in some in some cases there will be um, uh, a, a compromise between what's required by the protective effort and what's required by the staff. <clears throat> a system of concentric circles of security is set up with perimeters clearly defined with access controlled. As I mentioned, the magnetometers or what we normally call metal detectors. They were brought in in um, the 70s against the wishes of a lot of the management in the Secret Service who saw it unnecessary. But now it's a fundamental part and it's considered essential. They mag everyone who's going to be within a small arms distance of the, of the VIP. There will usually be another advance um, visit made possibly a week before the actual trip uh, just to make sure that everything that has been requested has been carried out and put in place and all the cooperating uh, local agencies um, are, have, have done what's requested. All the physical security um, and all the manpower uh, is in place and then on the actual day there is a huge footprint from the secret service they come in you have the uniform division you have agents you have protective intelligence people the magnetometer guys um, dogs doing sweeps for explosives counter sniper guys are setting up uh, everything is being done, everything's being checked to make sure that everything's ready for the eventual arrival of the VIP. 
and that process is well known to the um, Secret Service and they've been doing it for a long, long time. But a, a point I will make is that at the end of the day, the Secret Service is in charge. They control everything. What they say goes, particularly within the United States. It, it's actually law. And um, so any failings uh, are their fault. If someone uh, from a local agency hasn't done what, what's requested, it was down to the Secret Service guys to check that out, to make sure it's done. Quite often they will partner people up so that um, local guys uh, have a Secret Service either uniform or uh, agent with them who is on the service uh, radio network so information could be passed very very quickly so advanced security would have specified ideally that the area where the eventual um, sniper the young gunman uh, appeared would have been secured that what ideally would have been specified for that not to have been secured uh, is the first failure and we'll now go on to talk about some of the other failures so if the advanced security hadn't um, highlighted the uh, vulnerabilities, then uh, as the actual day progressed, and particularly with a counter sniper effort, at least two teams were present, um, should have made it obvious that there was a, a structure, a building that was an obvious um, potential uh, high ground um, threat and friends have said to me it's infantry tactics basic week one day one that you you notice things like that they are um such an obvious uh, feature to be uh, to attract your attention in the event um it's come out that a lot of the um, bystanders were pointing to the bad guy uh, and alerting police for possibly several minutes before the actual uh, gunshots, which, which is unbelievable. The Secret Service has long contemplated very, very... Com uh, complicated attack methods and sophisticated uh, attack teams by state actors, for example. Even back in the days of President Eisenhower, the Secret Service was contemplating protecting against radiological attack. So hazardous materials, biological agents, uh, teams infiltrating by airborne platforms, all things like this, the Secret Service think about. However, a lot of the failures uh, historically have been quite bumbling amateurs just wandering into the protective effort and, and ha taking a chance, having a, a go, as did this guy on Saturday. He had no training, um, no sophistication. Uh, all he had was the weapon and the... Um, the willpower to, to have a go at, at trying to kill um, a public figure. So it was an egregious failure and it beggars belief. So it, that isn't damning enough. We then come to the close protection effort around the President Trump and how they performed. So we'll discuss that next. The podium 
is ballistically armoured. This isn't a secret, it's been well known for a long time. And <clears throat> VIPs are briefed that in the event of uh, any kind of firearms attack to drop uh, below the podium uh, for protection. And <clears throat> upon realising that he'd been shot, that's what uh, former President Trump did. He, he, he dropped down. Very, very quickly, his uh, detail, the... Uh, on on the day shift, um, responded. They were they were fast. I, I doubt it could have been done quicker. They were on him, and the um, procedure is to basically dogpile, getting their armored bodies between the VIP and the bullets, and they did this. So they performed the core task of the bodyguard giving body protection <clears throat> to the VIP in an actual um, gunfire attack. So far, so good. The concept is cover and evacuate. <clears throat> so once you've got that cover, the next thing is evacuate. And you really have three options hold in other words keep him there until you have been told through your earpiece that the threat is down and that the route the evacuation route has been secured and you have people whose job it is to do that so you hold until you get that command then <clears throat> the other option is then to move move either to a holding area, a pre-designated safe room um, where there is um, further protection or to the lift point, which is the nearest um, point at which you can bring the vehicle. And uh, the vehicles are usually pre-positioned as close as possible to um, where the VIP is appearing in public. So hold until you get the clear and then move either to the holding area or to the limb and in the case on saturday the decision was made to move to the limb now there shouldn't be much discussion on that now in training the agents train extensively at the beltsville training facility and they do over and over repetitions of attack on principles, all sorts of variations on the rope line, at the vehicle, exiting the vehicle, exiting um, venues, on stage, um, in the street, in open, everything, exhaustively. And uh, it's drilled into them. And the idea is so that they are comfortable in chaos. And one of the points that always emphasized in such training is that communication can't be relied on radio networks get clogged people keep their thumb on the pressel some people panic and are saying the same thing over and over again repetitive um, language and you you can't rely on it so what communication uh, is needed you need someone to grip the team and give orders and the military acronym is CLAP the order m must be clear loud as an order with pauses so it's very clear prepare to move and and everyone knows what what's going on so um, <clears throat> we, we saw quite a bit of confusion and uh, mixed uh, chatter and, and people not knowing what was required of them they should be so well drilled. The detail um, should all know exactly what they have to do. It, it, it shouldn't be even a matter of question. It, it should be as well drilled as an American football team doing one of their plays. So such uh, verbal um, confusion is clearly a sign of overload 
and we'll go into that a little bit more now. There has been quite a considerable amount of finger pointing at uh, some of the female agents on the detail and um, to be fair much of it is well justified. However to me it's not a question of them being female it's a question of them being incapable of doing the job properly because there are some outstanding female bodyguards female soldiers female cops female martial artists who can do the job and it's really a disservice if we label all females with what we saw on saturday by those who obviously uh, had got gotten through a selection process um, without actually being suitable as an example um, on our bodyguard courses we had some pretty um, severe tests and one of the venues we used in South Africa the gym was upstairs so we took advantage of that and the gym test was to carry the VIP up, up the stairs, flight of stairs, as quickly as possible, across the gym floor to the corner, put the VIP in the corner without dropping him on his head, um, and protect him while surrounded by a group of um, fellow trainees holding pads, holding mitts, um, coming in at you. You've got to keep striking, keep them at bay, and the DS will present a weapon, a pistol, a knife in the mix, and you've got to do a disarm for two minutes. And uh, I, I remember clearly uh, one of our female um, trainees who was uh, a sergeant in the South African police working the streets of Joburg, which at the time was the murder capital of the world, uh, a leader. And um, she carried her male counterparts up the stairs and uh, without a problem and uh, w did a tremendous performance and she she was one of the three people on the course who were able to do a sub one second draw and hit uh, and that was working from um, uh, a, a concealed holster so to me uh, the question is is that person suitable for the job? It's regardless of uh, gender, obviously regardless of race, people of all races can be highly capable. It's a matter of individual qualities, individual uh, ability and um, the, the determination, the aggression, the grit, and the, the determination to protect the VIP no matter what happens. We, Marcus and I, used to use uh, an analogy or a model uh, of the predator, the prey, and the protector. And some people, um, call the protector the sheepdog and that works as well and if you're using that model do you want your dog to be like this or do you want your dog to be a poodle and unfortunately around the president there were a number of poodles on that day I counted at least five females in the uh, detail and that's a lot uh, I'm not saying all of them are tarred with the same brush, but one in particular has been highlighted. She was cowering behind her colleagues um, instead of offering a degree of protection herself, and she was totally inept when it came to weapons handling. Now, one of the things is um, the reholstering, and it's a thing that we always emphasised uh, a lot of people on uh, firearms training forums talk about uh, it, it, <clears throat> reholstering a weapon is a relaxed 
um, procedure. It's not under stress and you visually check the holster and put the pistol in it. That's not what you need for VIP protection. You need to be able to do eyes off reholstering. It should be a subconscious movement, uh, which is actually the reverse action of the draw. You just do the draw in reverse, get it back into the holster, no fumbling, while your eyes maintain a visual scan of what's happening around you. And the reason for this is you don't want to be diving into a car with a, a hot weapon in your hand. Um, now, not only did she fumble um, the reholstering, but she she muzzle swept her own hand and she muzzle swept one of her colleagues. And uh, another female agent came round the back of the limb and a uh, pistol in hand and, and did sweep uh, some people as well. So um, some bad marks for weapons handling there. President Trump survived by luck, not by the efforts of the Secret Service. And that is a failure. It's really reminiscent of the attacks on President Ford. Uh, in San Francisco, um, Squeaky Fromm, who was a follower of Charles Manson, uh, had hidden a 45 pistol and was in the bystander line, pulled the pistol out, uh, attempted to shoot at the president and was disarmed by a nearby agent and he got a commendation for it. However, she had actually already dropped the hammer and the fact was she had an empty chamber. It was her incompetence and lack of knowledge of... Um, the procedures on the 45 pistol, not the actions of the Secret Service that um, saved President Ford. <clears throat> then on a subsequent visit, um, Sarah Jane Moore had come to the attention of uh, San Francisco police by contacting them and saying she was going to test security. And she had a 45, uh, uh, correction, a 44 special revolver. They confiscated it and um, alerted the Secret Service and their protective intelligence people interviewed her and determined she wasn't a threat. Whereupon she got hold of another pistol, the 38, and got a shot off before um, a bystander in the crowd, a former Marine, um, uh, diverted her aim and um, uh, stopped her from uh, completing the action. So again, it was just pure luck. Um, that that happened the president was saved so um, relying on luck um, rather than uh, advanced planning training rehearsal and uh, other uh, technical security measures uh, is not actually the mark of an agency which prides itself on being the global lead in uh, VIP protection Okay, I'll just make a couple more points. Some of the first reports, uh, in fact, the first report I saw running on, on uh, new news on the TV was that it was an incident and that um, President uh, uh, Trump had fallen off the stage and they were rather comparing him to... Um, President Biden, who is noted for doddering about on the stage. And um, it, it was a completely um, spurious um, uh, re re reporting of what was actually an assassination attempt, where the uh, target was actually hit by the bullet. I was amazed that there were no drones being used by the Secret Service or by local law enforcement. Um, this has now become commonplace, um, even in the most routine law enforcement uh, 
uh, activities, you know, investigating uh, possible burglary or a drug den or whatever. <clears throat> Drones can be very sophisticated with thermal, infrared and detect people in foliage or people on top of structures. Seems to me that a drone uh, would have been ideal then, um, would have solved a lot of the problems. <clears throat> also, there are uh, briefcase um, shields which open up to provide um, ballistic protection. Now, the Secret Service doesn't seem to make use of these, but in um, places where the main threat is rifle caliber rounds, uh, rather than pistol caliber, um, they, they uh, would seem an obvious asset to at least be considered. <clears throat> Finally, there will be an AAR, an after action review by the Secret Service, which hopefully will highlight let and um, find lessons to be learned and um, procedures to be adopted. However, to do that, you have to admit the failures first. And admitting mistakes is not something that the Secret Service is well known for. There is actually quite uh, a toxic um, middle management structure and a very politically um, motivated leadership which... Um, have steered the Secret Service in, into um, the way it's gone in the past few years. And um, you only have to look at the former Secret Service um, managers who were grafted onto the um, Federal Air Marshals uh, in the early days after 9-11 and uh, what havoc they wreaked. So, hopefully, um, some facts will emerge, head should roll. Um, there are, without doubt, dedicated, professional, motivated agents uh, within the Secret Service, but um, in my opinion, they're let down by uh, levels above them. And the events on Saturday show that um, there are big, big problems. <clears throat> Finally, Gavin Lyle, um, talking about uh, a different organisation, had his uh, character once say, um, the only two things the Secret Service needs is to be secret and, of course, serviceable. Well, the US Secret Service has never been secret. It's never been a secret organisation. And in recent years, it has not really been serviceable.